On this episode of Common Mystics, we discuss part one of the fascinating story of the Doan family outlaws out of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It's a topic steeped in myth and mystery, but the facts are almost more intriguing than the fiction. I'm Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are common mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places, but for this story, we needed some help. True statement. Jill, talk to us about this story. Oh my gosh. This story comes to us during the American Revolution. It predates our country as we know it. Yes, that is true. And we found ourselves driving in Eastern Pennsylvania and we were picking up on some hits. Can you remind everyone first of what our intentions are? We asked the spirits to guide us to a verifiable story previously unknown to us that allows us to give voice to the voiceless. That's right. And when we were driving in eastern Pennsylvania, I immediately was feeling drawn to the north of the highway. And I was looking at these rolling hills with these little towns sprinkled throughout. It was just intriguing. And I was really honing in on them. And in that landscape, I was really picking up on a church energy, a church community vibe. I was feeling a Revolutionary War soldier, and he was unhappy, and actually he had a tin cup of coffee, and we were drinking Starbucks, and he was making me feel like you have no idea what life was like. That idea of a Revolutionary War soldier who's kind of disgruntled. I love that. Mm -hmm. I was picking up on a man at night on horseback in black with like a cloak waving in the wind behind him as he rode like top speed it felt very um to be honest it felt like the reverse of paul revere right like he was like urgent like going somewhere but like he felt like a thief he felt like he was like he was on a mission okay i was feeling a tavern a tavern would be important to this story taverns are always important to be honest Right. Mm, Can't live without them. I was drawn to the concept of poverty and what it would look like to be impoverished during the revolutionary times. And yeah. And that whole like class system, like, how did that look? Yeah. Like every time I think of the revolution, I'm thinking of like Ben Franklin and people that had means. I'm never thinking about people. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was picking up on. Interesting. So. We ended up in Philadelphia because why not? If you're in Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, you're going to Philadelphia. We loved Philly. Oh, my God, Jennifer. Yeah, it was great. I was looking for real estate again. (laughs) Yes, you were. I really was. So we ended up in Philadelphia, Independence Square. So Independence Square is like these series of buildings in in the center of the city. And you have to like go through a line to get inside the square. Yeah. And we were we were doing classic Jen and Jill mess around inside the complex of the Independence Square. And while we were there, I was feeling the heightened emotions, like an energy of excitement, anticipation. But I also was feeling like it was very singular. Like I had blinders on like Seabiscuit. Like I couldn't Ugh. I couldn't get off track. I had to focus on the, those feelings. Does that make sense? I think so. And I remember That we were drawn to a particular area of the square, right? Yes. And we were being drawn to the east side of the building. Mm -hmm. On the the west side was like the building where George Washington was and like the first Continental Congress and like all these kind of like really cool, important things. Iconic American things. Exactly. But instead of us being intrigued by that, like, wow, Washington was here. We were intrigued by this other building that we knew nothing about that was on the east side of the square. And the the land surrounding the buildings was captivating to us. Mm -hmm. We spent more time outside around that building that we didn't know what it was than inside the building where George Washington was like inaugurated. You're right. That's true. When you say Mm -hmm. it like that. Doesn't seem like a good a good use of time no. <laughs> when you're in Independence Square. Do we know what that building was, where, why we were drawn there? I don't know why we were drawn there yet, okay. but I do know that it was the old original city hall to Philadelphia. Okay, interesting. So we didn't stay our whole time in the square, of course. No, we needed to find cheese... Oh, cheesecake. <laughs> See, I'm such a... Chip. <laughs> we needed to find Philly cheesesteak. Isn't it cheesesteak? Yeah, so we needed to find food. We needed to find food for sure. And as we were walking around, 
we were drawn to Carpenter Hall, which is a historic building. And we didn't know why we were drawn there. But Carpenter Hall and Samuel Carpenter seemed very, very important. And I wrote that down. Over and over again, <laughs> there was these references to Carpenter, like yes. a different kind of Carpenter. There's a Carpenter here. There's a Carpenter there. Right. We're like, OK, we get it. We there get are carpenters. it. Carpenter. Yeah. Important. Check. <laughs> Check that box. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, and what Jill. else were we being pulled to? The Quaker Meeting House. That was insane. That was insane. Tell me why. Well, the first thing is we walk into this walled courtyard around the actual meeting house. And the meeting house is, is a museum and you can walk around in it, which we did. But first, we walked around the courtyard and we what we were looking for was the old Quaker Cemetery. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't find the cemetery. And then we finally found a sign explaining that, oh, we were standing on the cemetery. In fact, that entire courtyard is a cemetery with unmarked graves, except for a small number. I want to say it was four or five that were actually marked with headstones, but they were super hard to find. But you and I were on a hunt mm-hmm. searching around the the brush and the the trees and the and the bushes trying to find where are these four and we were singularly obsessed with finding the graves that were marked and there was this sense that this was important that there were quakers that were buried and where are they and are they marked or unmarked that is so true yeah i also want to say um how many times is it going to take for you and i to feel the feeling of a cemetery and not see it to realize, oh, it's beneath us. Yeah, right. How many times that did happens it, to you, us all the time. It's so funny. It's almost like, hey, girls, <laughs> maybe you should look down first. <laughs> Good point. Once we got into the meeting house and we were sitting there, Jen and I kind of separated and we were, Jen was taking notes. I was feeling passionate disagreements. It didn't feel like everyone was of the same mind. Yeah. Like there was there was this contradictory There's debate. Yeah. There was heightened emotion. Yeah, me yes. too. It didn't feel church like. Yes. You know, when you, I, I'm not a Quaker, no. I've never been to a meeting house during a Quaker meeting, but I imagine it's it's similar to going to church. Everybody's there and you worship. But the feeling here that I was getting, I agree, it almost felt like a courtroom. Mm-hmm. Like there was debates and there was contradictions Anger, and there was passion. Yes, yes it was very yeah, bizarre. Agreed. OK, so all of these hits led you to the legend of the Doan family outlaws. That's true, John. Can I tell you a little bit about them, please? So the Doan family, they were thought to be a family of Quakers living in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Very good. They were a large family. There was like nine kids. Five brothers out of this family would become the Doan family outlaws. And they had a cousin. Okay, so Moses was the oldest. And then came Joseph Jr., Levi, Malan, Aaron, and then cousin Abraham. This is a group of young men all in the same family who turn outlaws during what period of history? Right before, during, and after the Revolutionary War. Wow. And they're Quakers who turn outlaws. And why are they known as outlaws? What did they do? Well, besides stealing horses from the colonists and selling them to England, they were also reported to be spies for the Redcoats during the Revolution. And it's also confirmed that these men were responsible for robbing tax collectors oh. and notably the Bucks County Treasury. So they were actively working against the Patriots during the Revolutionary War period. That's right. Wow. And this family on their paternal side, they're like third generation Americans. So it's not like they just came over and they're like, oh, we're English. No, they were colonists. They were living in in the Americas for generations when this happened. Not only that, but their father, Joseph Sr., had two farms and money at the time. So it's not like they were going to create money. They had money. They came from wealth. So this episode is different from our other episodes because instead of just doing the research and presenting our case and our voiceless all by ourselves. This time you sought out some help. Can you explain why you were looking for help telling the story? When you Google 
the Doan family outlaws. There is no reputable source of information in a one-stop place online that clearly gives you all the information you need to know about the outlaws, right? Or the family themselves. So there's either these fantastic legends that like people write newspapers about, or there's websites of generations of living Doans that romanticize their family roots and who they were, but there isn't something that was like definitive. So I found that there was a miniseries being created about the Dones, and I couldn't find it. I saw the trailer, which was really, really cool, but I couldn't find the miniseries because I was just going to watch the miniseries and report back to you and be like, this is cool. Watch the miniseries. (laughs) Right. But I couldn't find it. So I sought out the producer and creator of the miniseries. Mark McNutt, by the way, is his name. Yes. And he was incredibly gracious with his time. And I emailed him and I said, hi, I'm a psychic. (laughs) And my sister's a psychic too. And we stumbled upon the story where he talked to us. And he responded, yes. And not only did he say yes, but he was like, do you know Katrina? She's like a big deal. Katrina Weedman, who is a known personality and paranormal investigator who has been on several TV shows. I lost my shit, but I was really trying to hold it together and be completely professional. So I was like, wait, who? But I was like, oh my God, yes. I was picturing her from everything I seen her in. And so they agreed to talk to us. Yes. And Jill, what I absolutely love, not only have they both studied this story of the Dones Outlaws and are, I would Mm -hmm. say, experts on the Dones legends and, and fact, but also they are both from Bucks County. So for them, this story Mm. is a part of their childhood, a part of their upbringing, and they bring that to this interview. So I'm so excited to share it with our listeners. You guys, please listen to the following interview. We are so excited to share it with you. Enjoy. We'll see you on the other end. Our first guest is actor, writer, creator, and producer, known for his work on the film P.S. I Love You with Hilary Swank, and who is currently producing a series about the Doan family entitled America's Original Outlaws. Thank you for joining us, Mark McNutt. Thank you for having me. Our second guest is TV personality and paranormal investigator, star of Paranormal Lockdown and Portals to Hell. We are so pleased to welcome Katrina Weedman. Hi, thanks for having me. So we have a connection to a story that both you, Mark, and Katrina know about and had studied at length. We're so excited to hear about what you guys know about the story of the Doan Family Outlaws. Yeah, would you like me to just start with a little bit of um, the background, as far as I know it, and the project? Yeah, tell us how you found about uh, found out about the Dones and what inspired you to create a series. So, I mean, uh, similar to Katrina, it was something that was sort of local lore. I was just always fascinated by the story. Um, we lived in the neighborhood, sort of on the edge of Doylestown Barrow, and there was a, a field behind us where there was an old farmhouse. And somebody had, there, there were these uh, pits dug all over the place. You know, someone was looking for something, right? I didn't know what they were. And I was uh-huh. eventually told that, yeah, you know, some of, you know they're, they're looking for the Doan treasure. And as a kid, I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. But then later, it was about 12, almost 25 years ago, when I became sort of reintroduced to the, to the story and at the time, I was working on building a journalism career, and I thought it would be, you know, it would be neat to do a, you know, an article, you know, to write an art freelance article and try to sell it to someone, uh, like the History Magazine or something like Smithsonian, about this this story from American past. So I just basically started doing research, and I did a lot of research, and then at some point, like so many other things, you know, you get busy with life, and it doesn't quite happen. And then in 2014, I was asked to drive um, with my parents, who were at the time, my my dad was the president of the the Philadelphia Area uh, Screen Actors Guild, and my mom was was on the um, the national board. And they wanted to drive to Harrisburg to do, you know, basically a lobbying event. Like, hey, support, you know, the film and TV arts in Pennsylvania. And asked me to drive, and they asked uh, a a local well-known actor to also, you know, come along for the ride. And th- this guy hadn't been in Philadelphia very long. He was from Massachusetts. Well, his name is David Morse. You've known him from like the Green Mile or 
World War Z, you know, from St. Elsewhere. That's what I remember from you growing up in St. Elsewhere. And I was just telling him about the, the history of the area. And I told him the story about the Dome Gang. And, you know, we, we chatted for about an hour, and he said, well, come on, that's really cool. What are you doing with it? I was like, I'm not doing anything with it. And it was through that conversation where I really sort of made the, the choice to really get into it, because I'd, I'd been reluctant. I'd been involved with other film production, and Katrina will understand this, uh, that went nowhere. It's frustrating, and it's time-consuming, and it can be very disheartening. And I was at a point where I really didn't want to do it anymore. This is, I don't want to do this anymore, until I had that conversation with David Morris. And he said, look, I think you should do this. Sounds really awesome. So I went home. I, I told my wife. I said, honey, I think I want to do this, but you have to know what you're getting yourself into. And to my surprise, she said, well, you know, I, I think you should. I was like, what? She's like, look, you've gone down so many different rabbit holes with different stories. And th you've worked on projects that you don't like at all. You have no creative interest in it. You, you know, you have no either ethic, moral, or just sort of spiritual interest in it. And here's something that you absolutely love that you know something about and you're passionate about, why wouldn't you do it? And that's when I was like, you know what, honey, I think you're right. So that's how I got started on it. That's amazing. Katrina, you grew up in the area similar to Mark? Yeah, so we grew up in the same town. And, you know, like Mark said, it was folklore for us growing up. And how I found out about them was the leader of the Don't Gang, his headstone is in my best friend's backyard. And we've been best friends since we were like three or four. And we're still best friends to this day. And, and but because we've been friends for so long, we fought like we were sisters, you know, so we, <laughs> we, yeah, we can relate. Had, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, we definitely have that sister vibe. And so when we were young, she'd be like, I have a cowboy buried in my backyard. <laughs> and I would be like, shut up. You do not. You're such a liar. And then we would like fight about it. And then um, finally, she said it one day in front of her dad. And he's like, yep, we do. Moses Stone. Wow. And I was like, oh, is she, I guess she's serious. And then fast forward to I was a senior in high school. And they in our, our district, they make us do senior mm -hmm. projects, which is honestly just this like BS thing that takes up time. And, <laughs> and I had proposed a couple of different things to do for my senior project. And my advisor kept turning me down for like everything I submitted. And that was also BS because like my husband was like, we, we grew up together and he was just like, uh, his senior project was building, I think a dog house. And they were like, sure. <laughs> and like everything else they were like, nope, you can't do that. So I was like, all right, well, so I went back to, you know, what other things am I really passionate about? And my dad is a huge history buff mm -hmm. and really instilled that love of history and respect for history when we were very, very small. So it's, it's something for me and my sister, it's something we're really, really passionate and interest, interested in. And so when I started thinking about it, I was like, well, kind of be cool to like go and get the deeds to our house because our house was really old, see who lived there, do a little research on the town and also do the don'ts because they're part of the history. So I did my whole senior research project on the don'ts and um, my dad, you know, would help me because he was really interested in it. And we have um, in, our, in the town we grew up, we have like a secret library Ooh. in the castle. It's very magical. Yeah. <laughs> and they have all the books and all the papers on it. And um, so my dad and I would go like every weekend and he would help me pull, um, you know, books and uh, any kind of info we could find on them so I could put my project together. And it just, you know, it's such a fascinating story that I think once you get into it, you kind of get lost in the mystique and like, how have I not heard about these guys before? How come nobody mm -hmm. talks about them? So around 2010, I started to approach uh, friends of mine in the industry because I've been working in television since 2006. And I was like, I really want to do something with this project. What do, what do I do? Like, how do I get this out? Because I think it's a story that really needs to be told. And the roadblocks I kept coming up against, which I know are similar to Mark's, were history is very hard to sell. Hmm. In television and film, it is extremely hard to sell because it's very expensive to make. The return is not always there. Um, so they normally want something that they know is going to be a slam dunk. So I, I then, you know, I kind of put it to the back burner and then it came up again in like 2016. 15 and 16, I started asking around to other industry friends. I'm like, I, I have this project that I really would love to get off the ground. And again, it was kind of like the same roadblocks. And then people had told me about Mark 
And then Mark and I randomly connected. Um, I kind of can't remember how we connected, Mark, but somehow we got put in touch with each other. And so Mark and I met and had coffee and just kind of talked about our love for the Dones and how, you know, it's such a shame that their story isn't known because it's so important to the birth of our country. We totally agree. And we can speak to the rabbit hole because I, for weeks, have been trying to flush out an outline. And it's so last minute that uh, Mark responded, thank you so much, because this is a dream come true to have both Mm -hmm. of you guys here, to my stalking emails on (laughs) Facebook. I'm like, I'm not crazy. (laughs) So we are so excited to hear about the Dones and their legends. Let's get right into it. (laughs) So Mark, do you want to start telling us a little bit about the family, who they were, and what kind of life they were living at the time? Sort of the myth of the Dones and legend was that they were or at least the way I was told it was that they were sort of a minor sort of family and dime store hoods and not. It turns out that that's not true at all. They had a very prominent family. The eldest Doan came from England and originally settled in Marblehead, Massachusetts. And then through one of the uh, William Penn uh, land grants, got land in Bucks County. And then the family grew. But they were a very prominent family and they, they, they owned property. Uh, at some point, one faction of the family, the kids of Joseph Doan, during the time of the Revolutionary War, decide, yeah, we're going to be outlaws and support the British. There's always been speculation as to why. There's various theories. Well, you know, there's, you know, you know, sort of fighting against taxation, right? But guess what? Everyone had to pay taxes. I can understand the Quakers not wanting to do it because of their faith, but these guys, there's zero record of any of the, the known outlaws ever attending a Quaker meeting. So that's interesting. To say that it was because of their, their, you know, their, their religion, it's just, it's just not true. So, yeah, so, at, you know, at some point, these guys, they decide to form what becomes the first American crime syndicate in the country. We know, we have documented that the gang comprised of at least 40 people and probably more. So this was not some small operation. And I was always told, like, oh, there, you know, it was nothing, nothing. That, that's not true. It was huge. They robbed, uh, um, um, what do you call it, the guys who take taxes? <laughs> Yeah, the tax collectors. <laughs> they rob "quote unquote" patriots, but there's stories of them robbing pretty much anyone. So at some point, the gang becomes notorious enough that the Pennsylvania Assembly issues basically what would amount to a warrant that they wanted them captured or killed. And we know that two of them, Abraham and Levi. So Abraham was the cousin. Levi was the one of the five brothers. So the five brothers that were sort of the core of the gang were Moses, Malan, Joseph Jr., Aaron, Levi. And then the other one was Abraham was the first cousin. So that makes up like the core of the gang. Abraham and Levi are caught. They're hung pretty much summarily without trial. Malin, you know, the, the legend is he was captured. And the story is that he was shackled somewhere n- near Baltimore. And somehow he was able to cut the back of his heel with a knife and slipped out of the shackles, jumped in the Baltimore Harbor, and he was never seen ever again. Most people think he drowned. Others said, well, he actually made it to the British ship and he went to England and two of the other guys escaped to Canada. Uh, Moses Stone is shot and and killed at at what could be considered the first sort of Western style outlaw, you know, sort of a shootout in this country at what's called uh, Halsey's Cabin. And uh, Joseph Jr. and Aaron escape and then end up going to Canada. Of course, they robbed the Bucks County Treasury of what's considered by, by some of the largest theft of public funds in U.S. history. And it's important to note that, yeah, there, there were bigger robberies. You know, the, the outlaws of the West robbed lots of people, but mostly mm-hmm. they focused on banks. Uh, this was public fund, and uh, they took it all. They took every last bit of it from Bucks County. So it is my understanding that to this day, it was the largest theft of public funds in U.S. history. Moses is my new spirit crush because apparently they have written about the way that they looked in the newspaper, like be on the lookout. And apparently the Doan brothers were tall, good looking, well-made, athletic. And there are different legends about how athletic they were. Do you guys know any of their early legends? And can you speak to before they became an outlaw band, like who they were as it? in legend as young people it's funny you said that because again my best friend she's she has like 
the spiritual connection to the Jones. And she's always, and she kind of says the same thing you do. She's like, they must've been so handsome. (laughs) And I think like growing up, that's what, that's a lot like folklore wise, (laughs) you know, and Mark can definitely speak to the truth of it, but folklore wise, that's what you would hear growing up that they were like six foot tall, Mm. very broad shoulder, very muscular for at that time, you know, that was abnormal um, for that kind of height. And, you know, that they were very, very athletic. One of the stories I remember hearing, and I think it was surrounding how Levi and Abraham got caught, that they were at a bar and somebody challenged them to like a jumping competition, but it wasn't, you know, how high you can jump. It was how far you could jump. And they like blew everybody out of the water. And because of their athleticism and their good looks, they were recognized at the bar. And everyone was like, oh, my gosh, those are the Doan outlaws. Um, so it's definitely it's it's funny that that's very much part of the legend is that they, they were like super handsome. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, in many ways, the, the Doan story that was first written about in the early 1800s kind of morphed into what would become the Western outlaw. There is a lot of connections between sort of the Western oh. outlaw motif and uh, the Doan gang. And I have this theory that, uh, and I did a little bit of research on it, I absolutely believe that, you know, the writers who are writing about the Wild West and the outlaws were perhaps influenced by the stories of the Doan Gang. And the reason I say that is some of the most prominent writers that went out West were from places like Philadelphia and New York. And if they're from this area, especially if they were were, were Quakers, they likely would have heard the story. Uh, it's interesting that James Fenimore Cooper, who we know, uh, you know, American writer who did... Um, Rocks and Mohicans. His first novel was called The Spy, and it turns out he comes from a very prominent Quaker family just across the river in New Jersey. So I have no doubt that he grew up hearing stories about the Duncan. Well, it's also The Last Mohicans. The, uh, I can't remember who's the prominent Native American in the movie and in the book. I can't remember his name, but he's buried in the next county over. Yeah, there's a huge uh, Quaker cemetery in Lehigh oh. Valley. And a lot of the Mohicans are are buried there. And um, so like kind of the echo marks point, it was, you know, very historical area. And those stories absolutely circulated. Interesting. So they were all hot, but there was one standout in the legends. There is one sort of leader that kind of emerges as the Robin Hood or, you know, as the one who sort of comes out into the spotlight. Yeah, Moses was the I mean, he was Moses was the star. He was the leader. He was. Um, yes, he's kind of the one that I'm playing oh, yeah, with yeah, my you're hair. Like, Tell me more about him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh. uh, yeah, he was definitely the star of, of the whole right. thing. So there is a part of the legend that Moses and his father had a falling out. Are you guys familiar with that? Yes. Okay, and then he he goes, he gallops away on his horse and he saves this maiden from an imminent attack of natives on her house, her family farm and her family. And then it turns sad because she rejects him. (laughs) Is that true? Is there any can you want to speak to that legend? I can tell you that at least at this point, there's very little physical evidence to support that. But I have found through my experience that. So much of what I was told originally was just myth turned out to be true. Mm. So, I, yeah, absolutely. A lot of it. Oh, really? So, for example, like, the, you know, the, the, the spying. I, when I started this years ago, I met with some people who were what I would consider at least, at least one individual who's considered a Doan scholar. And he told me that, that you know, the whole spying thing was not true. It was, it was made up, uh, and there's no evidence to support it. So I said, look, they're spies. If they are half good at what they did, there shouldn't be any evidence. But we did find evidence, strong evidence, through the project. Um, there's also the legend that, you know, it was, you know, when uh, Washington crossed the Delaware. Yes. So it was Moses Stone who crossed in advance and, and tried to warn uh, Colonel Raw. And again, I was told that that was just, just complete made up, you know, to sell books. But it turns out it might very well be true, except, you know, it may not have been Moses Doan. It may have been another character uh, named Vidian Gurdon, uh, who was part of the gang. But, yeah, that's true. With regard to the idea of them being sort of associated or involved in the occult, I was always told, oh, no, nothing there, nothing there. And then I learned, oh, their uh, great-grandfather kicked out of the Quaker meeting house for being involved in, in, in occult practices. 
So it's not a big stretch to see how small communities would, you know, you know, especially given what was going on with the domes and how they, they successfully operate for about 10 years, which is amazing, uh, that people might start to think like, well, how are these guys, you know, getting away with it? You know, well, you know, their family, you know, you know what they come from. The apple doesn't too, fall too far from the tree. So I have no doubt, although there's no, we have not found any sort of documented uh, history with that. And I have no, you know, I don't know if the Jones were involved, you know, the gang was involved in that stuff. But I could certainly see the community thinking it. Absolutely. That's a really good point. If we stick to the spying for a second, what would it have motivated this Moses to collaborate with his brothers and his cousin to kind of stick it to the Patriots in that way? Like, why? what was, what was driving that? Well, I think, and Mark, I mean, you can probably speak more specifically to the Dones, but I think, you know, and a lot of the people I've met who work with, you know, Revolutionary War history and not everybody was on board for this. There were a lot of people who were against it. And, you know, so, and I think what's interesting to me about the Don't story is because, you know, history is kind of funny because it seems so foreign to us sometimes because it it becomes this thing of that was two, 300 years ago. That's forever. And it's, it's almost like we have a hard time identifying with the people. But I think what becomes really mm-hmm. curious about them to me now as an adult, especially after the last couple of years where, we, where we've seen so much conflict in our own country, and we've seen so many families divided over political reasons that it it kind of when you go back and read about the Dones and, you know, the family tensions that were there, the town tensions that were there, the country tensions that were there um, and, you know, kind of brewing as we're going through the revolution, it it's it's almost like kind of you have a newfound connection to them in that time period. And I found that to be the most interesting thing to come out of, you know, revisiting them in recent years. Yeah, I would agree with Katrina completely. And what more than anything continues to motivate, because doing, doing this, what I'm doing, which is essentially developing two shows. So I have a, a scripted, basically a fictionalized version, uh, sort of like a Game of Thrones version of the Done story. And then what I'm working on uh, with, the um, documentary series. And more than anything, I think this is a really important American story. I really do. I think Katrina hit it on the head with that. And there's certainly lots of things that you can point to about what's happening today in our country that is very reflective of that. You know, we have this sort of romanticized, the way we're taught about the American Revolution is very, very simplified. So, and it's been taught the same way for a hundred years, and it goes like this. Uh, There was a tea party, Bunker Hill, uh, Betsy Ross made a flag, Washington across the Delaware, and hey, next thing you know, we won. That's it. You know, but the truth is, it was close to a civil war. And you had, most scholars believe, a solid third were patriots, a solid third were loyalists, and a solid third were just trying to figure out what to do or to stay out of it. So it was an extraordinarily contentious time in a way that I, I think we today don't quite appreciate or understand. So part of my motivation with telling the story, and it's not the sort of, you know, you know I'm not going at this as if I want to paint the, the Doan gang in a you know, particular way or not. First of all, the United States doesn't exist. There's no constitution. You know, like, yeah, they, they call them traitors to the American cause, but they, they started their career before there was really a country. So, you know, I've always seen them as basically a bunch of restless young men who were just pissed off about something and found a way to relieve that angst. And then they, they just, they just got over their head. It got, it got out of control. It got way out of control and it led to basically their complete destruction. I think the most uncomfortable revelation that Jen and I had researching this story is the fact that you're confused about your identity as an American because of the way we learned about the revolution, like flag flying, lighting off fireworks, love America, star spangled. And then you realize that the people that were living in the cities that were really affected by things like the Stamp Act wasn't necessarily affecting people in Pennsylvania the same way, right? And and how that they were being taxed for a war cause to support the Patriots the same way King George was taxing the colonies to support his wars. So it feels so like there's this hypocrisy, there's this give and pull. And you think, like, whose side am I on here? Because that would suck if I were a don't. 
right? What would the government be like? So they, just these people that are taking and taxing me that I don't necessarily like, all of a sudden win and now there's a government? You know what I mean? Like it really speaks to who we are as Americans. And the only takeaway that for me that's positive is that, wow, we were just as divisive then as we are now. <laughs> and that it's kind of comforting in a weird way because you're like, oh my God, this country's falling apart. Everyone has different points of view. And now it's like, oh, we've always been a mess. And it kind of gives me this comfort like, oh, that's okay. We'll get through it kind of feeling. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I actually find that I, I hear what you're saying because I think my family wasn't different than anyone else's family during the last couple of years where there were fights happening, you know, and there were fallouts happening. And when Mark and I started talking about his project and, you know, going into depth about the research he's done and everything, there was kind of this sense, I, I guess, similar to what you're saying of, you know, how it's kind of funny, you know, that it's just the same thing happening again. And again, it's like wash, rinse, repeat. And, you know, hopefully, I, I, it's it's interesting. There's um another really interesting figure from our hometown is Mercer. He's 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 the one. There's uh, three castles in our hometown, and there are Font Hill, the Tile Works, and Mercer Museum. And his name was Henry Chapman Mercer. And I always describe him as the like 1800s version of Indiana Jones. He was this very wow. eccentric, wealthy young man who uh, his rich aunt kind of funded his lifestyle. He was very well educated and he went off and like explored Europe for 20 years and it collected. All he was kind of like a hoarder, actually, <laughs> but like of really interesting pieces. And he collected all of this stuff and he built a whole museum for it. But what he did in the I can't remember the year I want to say it was like the 1920s. But he did a lot of research to find out where Moses Stone was exactly buried because nobody had really, nobody really knew because his parents, his family specifically did not want people to know where he was buried because they knew his grave would be desecrated. Mm -hmm. So Henry Mercer did a lot of research to try to find out where the body was so we could mark it. And the townspeople were very angry about this because they're like, you're glorifying somebody who did bad things and we don't want that in our town. And essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, his sentiment was, I understand that we're not glorifying him, though, but it's important that we recognize this history. It's important that we recognize what happened so we don't have it happen again. You know, so he was he was very much a historian, a preservationist, an archaeologist. Um, mm -hmm. And this piece of history was very important to his work. And he thought it was important to future generations to know about. So it kind of makes me sad that it's been you know, so watered down um, and that most people have never heard of the story unless you're from our town. And even then it's, you know, a lot of people haven't heard of it. Mark, can you tell us about the um, process that you've just recently gone through to try to find Moses and his remains? Sure. So Katrina mentioned her best friend has got Moses done in her backyard. So there's a field nearby here. And this, the story is back to Henry Mercer. He did some research. He grabs a, a chunk of granite or whatever it was, and he has it engraved. It says, you know, here's, you know, here lies the, you know, the body of the Tory outlaw, you know, who died, you know, by force of arms. And then, and then the other story was where it is now. You know, the other legend was, well, that's not where it originally was. And the, the story was that, well, you know, uh, it was in the field, right? And the farmer was trying to plow, so so he tied you know tied the slab around with chains and pulled it out. That doesn't make any sense to me, having sort of now researched it. There was just as many fields and farming, maybe more then. The, there were fewer trees there than there would be today. You would not bury somebody in the middle of a field like that because you wouldn't want them being churned up. So I never quite you know bought that. So what we did was we um, we went to where the slab is. And we did some research. I do have a photo that Henry Mercer took where he writes on it in his own handwriting saying, you know, this is where the body of Moses Stone is, you know, by the uh, hickory sapling, you know, you know, in, uh, I guess it's, what is it, Bedminster there, Katrina? It's Plumstonville. Oh, uh, Plumstonville? Yeah, which is for listeners, it's like uh, still in Bucks County. It's all in the same area. Yeah. So what we did, we started with the first day we were there, we just started simply with 
uh, metal detector. Because the story is that, you know, when Moses Stone was, was killed at Halsey's cabin, that the posse took him and his body to a tavern, and they kind of partied over him for a bit, and then brought him to his grandfather's house. From there, it gets a little... I'm not really sure. Does the family bury him or maybe the posse? It's it's really kind of unclear. But what is clear is that there wasn't a ceremony and he was likely quickly buried maybe within hours from the time they had the body back. So chances are he was buried in whatever he was wearing, which would include things that would be metal. So that's why we started with metal detecting. And we went through and honestly, we didn't we didn't get many hits at all. So then I contacted uh, someone who does uh, ground penetrating radar, and I had him set up. We were going to do it, and the last minute he backed out. So then I was like, "Well, I need to do something interesting, or, or, or you know, sort of figure it out." I reached out to uh, someone locally who does divining rods, uses dowsing rods. I got it through sort of basically a community chat because you know there's still folks up here that that will use it. There's people who still work professionally as dowsers are hired off you know, by electric companies and water companies. <laughs> and I was first, I first, I'd, I'd known about dowsing because, you know, I, I watched you know, stuff like that. And I'll never forget, you know, maybe like 10, 15 years ago, I was walking up the street and there was someone from the, our local water authority dowsing, you know, to find the thing they were, they were going to dig into. And I was like, are you serious? Like, I, you know, was the guy like joking? No, they weren't joking at all. So in some communities, it's still, I mean, it's still used. That's so cool. Seriously. And up here, apparently it is. So we went, I took this, you know, this guy over there and immediately he was getting hit and he had, we went around the slab and he was having me put like these little flags down. And at some point he started to, to retch and he walked away and I had no idea what was going on. And I, and the, you know, I looked at my crew and, the, and we were like, oh, what should we do? Nobody knew what to do. The guy must fell over. And this is not some, this is like just some sick middle age in his 60s, former uh, is a Navy veteran. Uh, he, you know, looks like sort of a regular guy from around here, which means he's got a beard and a camo jacket and wears boots. And so it's not what you think of when you think of someone who might be sort of more spiritually inclined. And he walks away and I look at the crew and I just give him the symbol, like, you know, keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling. So he had already lost his mic. We were all mic'd up. For whatever reason, his fresh battery, once it was on his body, drained it immediately. And my sound guy, who I spoke with today about this in advance of this conversation, reconfirmed that for me, that he'd never seen anything like that before with this guy. So he walks away, and he's, he's crying. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, like, I felt bad. Like, I, I didn't know what to do. You know, but at the same time, I hate to say it, but I'm like, wow, this is great television. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... You know, and I'm like, are you all right, man? You're right. That's completely fair. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he didn't have a mic, but I still had my mic on. So we picked it up through my mic. And he's, he's just saying, you know, he's here. He's here. And I'm like, who's here? He's like, he's here. I'm like, who's here? And he's like, you know, Moses is here. I'm like, you mean his body is here? Or is he here in spirit? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. But he's very, very sad. He's very sad. And he's telling me that there's something about, like, his honor and I asked him when I, I spoke to him yesterday about that. His feeling was that, number one, that he never thought he was properly buried. And that his story that is, you know, people don't maybe understand it the way that he wants his legacy to be. Something like that. And that was about two years ago. So it, it, I was fascinated when, Jill, you reached out to me and told me about this. And some of the things you mentioned were kind of in line with things that we were discovering. Yeah. Jen and I really believe there's something about this story that is so much bigger than us in this little podcast. There's something bigger here that we're just scratching on. And these people want this story to be told. There's no way that this can just be uh, serendipitous without like the Mercer Museum is creating an exhibit in 2024. Your mini series that I personally am really excited to see about. The whole thing is fascinating for so many different reasons. And Mark, when you were talking about possibly the Dones brothers being the inspiration for the cowboy archetype, that is 
insane. I had never thought about that. And then bringing in the whole connection with James Fenimore Cooper and his work. That's just crazy. What I think is also just fascinating about this family and and Moses in particular is that you brought up George Washington, right? And I think we have all seen that iconic image of Washington crossing the Delaware, right? Clutching his coat and the and the weather is terrible and it and he makes it and legend puts Moses Doan right there in the middle of it. And in that legend, he he knows the army. He's watching. He's spying for the British. And he knows the Continental Army is on the move. And he rides his horse as fast as he can. And and he makes it all the way to the British general, Rawl, who happens to be in the middle of a card game and so won't see him. And so instead, he writes a note and sends it to him. And the general just puts it in his pocket and doesn't read it like that's insane that legend puts him right there. If only, if only General Rawl had read the note, Dones would have saved it all from, you know, the Patriots, right? Like, it's it's just crazy. And I don't understand what the fascination with is with this family. I don't, it's big and I don't get it. It's really big. You know, when I start talking to people about the story, there's very few people. In fact, I'll say there's nobody I've ever had an opportunity to talk more than like 10 minutes about this who are just completely fascinated. And in the teaser that I have for the, the documentary uh, series, uh, the lady who is the current curator at the Washington Crossing Park and former uh, program director at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, when she says the United States may not exist, had the Dones been successful, the United States may not exist, that is absolutely true. Absolutely true. It makes me feel so fragile. It's, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, we realize that so much of what we have today, had things changed even slightly, the whole world would be different. So these guys, rightly or wrongly, contributed to where we are today in a very, very profound way. And, you know, just as sort of a, an American story, it should be told. And like Katrina, what blows my mind more than anything is, why doesn't everyone know the story? The other thing that comes to mind is history class, right? All through elementary school, when you learn about the revolution and the origin of our country, you don't hear about the other side. And it's, of course, a foregone conclusion that the Patriots are going to win. And you're just kind of going through the motions of learning how it happened. But you don't really appreciate that it could have gone either way, like you just said, Mark. And I almost feel brainwashed now, like really thinking about what was happening. (laughs) Like that was not presented to me when I was learning about my country. It gets me fired up. Like, why why aren't we really presenting what it really was? And it was a very precarious situation. And the ending, the the end was not clear. And it could have gone either way. So anyway, I'm just I'm I'm fired up now. (laughs) Um, We I'm very sensitive because you guys are spending so much time with us. But I I have a couple specific questions about the legends that I want to know, true or false. So you guys can either say like BS or or fact. It's kind of like a lightning round. And you both can answer like your own perspective and what your circle of reference is. Joseph Jr. dressing up like a lord and like crashing at different people's houses in Philadelphia, like the elite people of Philadelphia and like totally like pretending to be like an English lord. True, false. Again, it's one of those things where I don't. There might be some documentation out there. It's just one of the stories that's passed around. But it's certainly in keeping with what we know about their personality. It's fabulous. Part of my show, I uh, I interview. I've included a, a guy who is a behavioral psychologist, and he's also interested in this idea of I forget what it was called. It's sort of an emerging sort of a, uh, psychology where it's sort of a historical psychology where they can make, based on certain behaviors of patterns, even in the past, they can basically create a, a, a profile. He would say, like, absolutely. These guys, you know, in his mind were, if this is him, not me saying it, were criminal psychopaths uh, or sociopathic. And that, yeah, of course they would, would do that. And eventually, the, you know, the stores, and here's the thing about them, you know, the idea of them being pure loyalists, I, I, I don't think it's true at all. I just think they were opportunists. And uh, that wow, was, that's different. Oh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, I know they call them. I don't. I don't believe that way at all. 
I, I would tend to lean into the legend too, because I think these were young men who got away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> And I just think, you know, just what we even just like relating it to people I, I've known personally, like there is an ego that exists around that, especially when you have a band of, of brothers with you and you're all getting away with it. And, um, you know, I think, too, I wouldn't be surprised if they were casing people, you know, casing joints, so getting to know the elite so they can weaponize that, you know, um, so and it kind of relates back to that space you know, their spy history. So I, I, I would believe that there's got to be some truth to that legend. I love that. What about the widow or the, the, um, Jen, you say it. I love this one. So the, I can't remember, was she a patriot? She was a patriot widow. And her children were starving, but she couldn't get a pass to go buy flour for her children. So she was sneaking around. And when the British soldiers found her sneaking around, they um, they confiscated the flour. But um, Moses Doan saved her and gave her back her flour. And I think he killed the guard, too, in the legend and then gave her cash off of his own person so that she could buy food for her children. All right. And don't say it's false because I love Moses for this. <laughs> Are you going to break my heart, Mark? No, I'm not going to break your heart. You know, that's one of the stories that, again, it's almost impossible to verify. But if you apply, if, if you do the study and then you use a little bit of conjecture uh, and try to figure out what was going on, if uh, these guys weren't pure loyalist fanatics, but opportunists, and the legends always sort of suggest that Moses, Moses was had a little bit more sort of morality than some of the other guys. That he believed in sort of justice, right? I could see that. I could totally see that. The other thing is there, there's another there's another part of that that story that I've come to learn. They they place where this happens in in a different location. So in the story you're referencing, yeah, they place it. Uh, it was during the, the the British occupation of Philadelphia, and I, and I think that's true. And we know that they were operating with the British. We know that. That's a fact. So, yeah, they would have been back and forth in Philadelphia all the time. But if their motivation is simply, I mean, that is such an outlaw motif, mm -hmm. you know, or archetype. So, so, yeah, I can totally see that with Moses. And, you know, again, going back to the idea of, you know, them being an archetype for the Western outlaw, you know, they were known even at the time as the Plumstead Cowboys. We think of the idea of cowboy as something that doesn't exist until after the Civil War. But it was well used during the Revolutionary War to refer to loyalist outlaws. Wow. So when you get later to the cowboy, you think, oh, they're cowboys because they're on horses and there's cows. No, that, the, 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 the term cowboy goes back to the American Revolution. No, I would just I would agree with Mark. And I think everything I've read about them, they seemed very temperamental. It almost seems like, you know, one minute they could be fine and dandy and the next minute they would turn on you, you know, just depending on their strategy or maybe how they felt that day or maybe how they felt about that particular person. So everything I've read ha have seemed like they could shift at any moment. I wouldn't say it's not true. I could see it being a true story. I hope it is. I would love to believe that it's true. <laughs> Thank you. you know? You've given me hope. I know. <laughs> I want I it to be true. It's so Errol Flynn, isn't it? Yes. It's Robin Hood. It is Robin Hood. Living in and hiding out in caves. True, false? So, uh, again, one of those things that I've asked uh, various scholars. And again, the answer is, well, there's no evidence. But the truth is, where we are in Bucks County, there's caves everywhere. Uh, this part of Pennsylvania is basically sitting on a gigantic limestone underneath. So we have probably hundreds of miles of caverns below us that no one knows anything about. So if you're going to be successful and be on the run in a community and even broadly where, where you know, people talk, my feeling is, they, of course they would. I mean, why wouldn't they? You know, I also believe that, that they, you know, they avoided a lot of the roads and used the creeks. So around here, we have some uh, strategic creeks, right? There's the, uh, you know, a little bit south of us in Chester County is the Brandywine. And then the Montgomery County is the Perkyoman. 
and then you move into Bucks County, and we have uh, the, the Tohegan. Those are sort of like the three sort of main big creeks. And then there's other tributaries off them. I absolutely believe that they use those creeks to navigate and to stay away from uh, some regular traffic. So my, yeah, no proof, but yeah, of course they would. I, you know, I would have if I was an outlaw and was aware of these places, and I'm sure they, they were aware of them. Well, and that's the thing, too. It's like people use the caves now. You know what I mean? Like when I was a teenager, people would go to the mm. caves and like drink and party and, you know, and mm. then I had friends who would go and metal detect in the caves looking for Doan treasure, you know? So I just think I'm with Mark that it just it just makes sense, you know, and the the lime kilns, they, I, they there were kilns that, oh, gosh, I can't remember the size of them, but they have like old pictures of like the men standing in the kilns and they're like surrounded. I mean, they're huge caverns, you know, that, that are in this area. So I just think it makes sense. And, and also Hmm. I think, you know, I see this a lot in the paranormal work when we're trying to dig, dig through history. So much is orally passed down because for a couple of reasons, sometimes small towns, they lose their records. It just happens. Um, Sometimes things aren't documented Hmm. because either they didn't think they were important or they were purposely not documented. That happens a lot. <laughs> like I've like it's just stuff that I've seen continuously mm. throughout, you know, the close to 20 mm. years I've been working in in television and when you're trying to dig through history and especially in smaller towns. Um and especially, you know, the domes there's there's a lot of debate about whether they were good or bad. And generally when I was growing up from what I heard, the opinion of them were they were bad. They weren't good men. But I mm. think if that was a consensus that a lot of people had, then they probably wouldn't have wanted to document a lot of things that happened. They, want, they would have wanted to brush it under the rug because that's just human nature. That's what, and you can see that in any small town you go to. You know, I've seen it so many times. So, so I, I, I think, and I understand, like you know, all the experts that uh, Mark speaks to and everything. Their consensus on well, if it's not documented, we can't say it, which is true. But I, you know, I'm in agreement with Mark where there's, you know, well but there's holes, you know, so what could those holes mean? So, yeah, I totally believe they use the cave systems. Well, yeah, and, and I think just, what, what, Katrina, I'm sorry, just to, with regard to the meme, bad guys. Um, when you have an outlaw franchise, so to speak, that has as many as 40 guys, at least, you're going to attract some real a-holes. You are. Mm. Scummy people are going to be attracted to that. So what I would like to find out is, how many of those stories of the Doan gangs do, you know, doing re- like murder and other thing was them or people who were associated mm. with them? And they just said, oh, well, it's a Doan gang. Yeah, I totally agree. You know what I mean? That was a Doan gang. Yeah, because we also have, was it Aaron or Joseph? It was Joseph that came back to apologize for his family. And I don't think you do that unless yeah. you mm-hmm. have some sort of moral compass. You know, so I think it, I think a lot of it goes back to what Mark said earlier in the conversation that these were young men, maybe opportunists, and things got really, really out of hand. And that, you know, I think Mark is exactly right where it probably attracted some, you know, pretty colorful characters who probably didn't have good intentions at all. But I think just the act of Joseph coming back to, you know, apologize for everything that happened, he didn't have to do that. And, and he did that. That was a choice. So I think that shows, I think that shows some character there, or at least some character growth in his years. Two things, two closing thoughts that I have. And then Jen, if you want to pipe in and thank you guys so much for all your time, like, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Truly. First, this area of the country really um, surprised me. Jen and I have driven around since kids, like our mom would just put us in the car and we would just drive around and the energy coming off of the land in Eastern Pennsylvania is so strong and so intriguing. It really did shock me. And just hearing about the limestone and the creeks, those are metaphysical things that I like use to like, like stop eating as much. You know what I mean? Like I'm like bringing those things into my world to create something, to bring about energy. And that is naturally exuding from the land in your area. So it's really special. And it's surprised me. Also, I think it's really clear that this story needs to be told because they're not letting up. 
And um, I really am excited with Mark to continue the conversation. But Jen, what do you have to any closing thoughts? Because this has been amazing. You don't even know. <laughs> like, honestly, I just wanted to thank you both. It was it was great meeting you. But Katrina, at one point, you turned off your mic. So I just wanted to know what you wanted to say. Oh, yeah, I was gonna actually agree with Jill about the energy in this area. It's funny. Um because there were uh, there was a part of Bucks County called New Hope where all the impressionist artists would go in the 1900s, and they all lived in this area because there was there was such like a connection to it, and there was so much beauty there. The landscape was so you know unique, um, and also you have uh, Oscar Hammerstein who chose to make his home here, and um, and the Von Trapp family oh. came to Doyle's town, and yeah, oh yeah. Um, so, you know, it's pulled Aww. artists and um, intellects and writers and architects and all sorts of different um, people for, from different fields because they feel some some sort of connection here. Um, and it's funny, you can actually go, there's an old episode of I Love Lucy where they talk about Bucks County. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, because it really? was, uh, especially because, you know, Hammerstein was living here. And um, there's an episode where... She talks, she's trying to impress one of her neighbors in Manhattan. And so she's like, oh, well, we have our country house in Bucks County, you know, and they don't, but, <laughs> but she's just trying to impress her neighbor. Um, so you can, there's a lot of references to Bucks County and media. Uh, we were just watching too. Gosh, what was it? Something with Bradley Cooper. It was a movie that just came out. I think Taylor Swift is in it. What is it called? Um, is it Amsterdam? Amsterdam? Oh, I know what you're talking about. I think yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Amsterdam where they mentioned Bucks County as well. So it's it's always been a pull for artists and and history history buffs especially. So it's, it's a pretty magical place. The other one, Katrina, I just thought of. Um, um, oh that yeah. yeah, HBO series, The Gilded yeah. Age. Anybody you know, familiar with that one? So the the main character is supposed to be from Doylestown, and she's from supposedly. A family that sounds very familiar or similar to like the Mercers and the Chats. Ah, probably. That would make is... sense to me. Yeah, it's a very cool place. Thank you. You guys are amazing. I This is more than I could have ever asked for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay. RIP me. That happened. Can you even imagine? No, I cannot believe that we actually talked to Mark McNutt and Katrina Weedman. But I, you know what's surprising is that this conversation took some supernatural turns that I was not expecting. Tell me what you mean. Tell me everything. Okay, so first of all, that whole discussion about whether or not the Doan family was using the occult to help them get away with their exploits. Like, that's nuts. And that people actually believe that as part of the legend. Why not? Well, I mean, we do it all the time. Use what you got. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that Bucks County itself, that area is a magical place. When we were in that area, literally, it felt special. Yeah. We felt like we were in a special place. And I cannot believe that I did not know anything <laughs> about Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Jennifer, how did it's so close? <laughs> How do we not know this? The limestone, the cave systems, the creeks and tributaries, all of it, the water and the stone. I mean, it really is a magical place that's packed with energy. It has castles, Jen. <laughs> There's three castles. For real. And then Mark's friend, who is a dowser, who uses dowsing rods. And the story he told about looking for Moses's unmarked grave. This dousing guy was emotionally affected by his search, and it sounded like he was channeling Moses Doan himself. And he actually said that Moses was telling him that he didn't get a proper burial, that he is sad, and he is misunderstood by the history. So that leaves me wondering, is Moses Doan our voiceless? I have so many questions, that being one of them. Mm -hmm. I want to know who these people are, yeah. like for real. I want to get past the legends. I want to know their motivations. Yes. I want to know what motivated these people because it had, to me, it seems like it's so much more than what we know or what we will leave to be true. Mark and Katrina hit on that very question in the interview when they talked about, are the Dones good or are the Dones bad? 
right? And that's essentially Mm -hmm. my question too. Were they outlaws because they were acting out of loyalty to the English crown? Or were they opportunists who were taking advantage of the turmoil of the situation to profit through espionage and thievery? Like, who are these people? And then On top of all that, why are they reaching out to us and Katrina and Mark in a real way? And not only them, but in Bucks County, the Mercer Museum, that fabulous castle created by the hoarder that Katrina spoke about, that museum is opening an exhibit regarding the Doan family in 2024. A brand new exhibit. A brand new exhibit. So it seems like people independent of each other are intrigued, inspired at this moment by these people. This is so much bigger than us. Do you think we'll have any opportunity to talk to some of the historians at the Mercer Museum? I spoke to Annie and Clint, and I have to tell you, they're lovely. And they agreed to speak with me again on record for our listeners. Wonderful. And what about, do you think there's any opportunity for us also to follow up with the dousing guy? I have his number. (laughs) And I am so bold. I am going to find him, call him, and have a conversation not just about that day with Moses, but his process. I mean, that's just really cool. And I've tried the dousing rods before. I'm doing something wrong. Me too. I need to learn. Yeah, for sure. Very good. Jen, if somebody wanted to reach out and learn more about Mark's projects with the Doan Family Outlaws or what Contrita is up to because she is just amazing, where would we send them? You can check out Facebook, America's Original Outlaws, for more information about Mark's project. And again, he's not only doing a scripted miniseries, but he's also working on a documentary, too. So check out his Facebook page, America's Original Outlaws. And we will also drop the link to his most recent teaser for the series in our show notes. He said it's not ready for public viewing yet, but it will be soon. I'm super excited. Now, as for Katrina, you can reach her at Katrina Weedman on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. And her website is KatrinaWeedman.com. She has so many projects in the works, Jill. She is currently doing Travel the Dead, which is a multi-part paranormal investigated series on her YouTube channel and new videos hit every Wednesday night. So check that out for sure. She also just recently did the last physical calendar for pinupsforpitbulls.org. And you can still get a calendar with her in it and autographed as well, if you wish. You can check out her website at katrinaweedman.com for that. And finally, she has an upcoming new single called Suffer Me that is being released in March. Also, she is doing her first in-person event in three years this May for White Hill Mansion Paracon. Check out whitehillmansionparacon.com. And she's doing it to raise money for that historic location. So, wow, lots going on with Katrina. And again, all this information will be dropped in our show notes. I want to know, is there a petition we can sign to get back Paranormal Lock-In? Paranormal Lockdown? Yeah, we need that back. I loved Paranormal Lockdown with Katrina and Nick Groth. However, I got to tell you, I'm really liking Portals to Hell, too. It's scary. But I like Jack Osborne and Katrina Weedman together. So you have to check that one out, Jill. I know. You usually record them for me. So I (laughs) I get get all my Katrina fix when I go to your house. All right. So um, do you want to tell people where they can find us? Okay. Well, before I do that, I just want to say, you guys, we love you. Thank you so much for everything. I have an ask. Can you please tell your friends to listen to us? (laughs) Download our... Subscribe. Or subscribe and download our podcast. That would mean so much to us. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell the people at the grocery store. Tell everyone you know that's interested in podcasts because we are growing and we are so excited to have new friends and to build this community. Other than that, you can find us on our website, commonmystics.net, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Common Mystics Podcasts. Download us and listen in wherever you're hearing your favorite podcast. But if you happen to be on Apple, please leave us a positive review so other people can find us. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.